Hi everyone, I'm Ellie McBain. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk at you today. So just a bit about me, I'm an industrial design student at QUT who's coming to the end of my honours program. I've always been interested in science and science education, specifically about awareness. Um, so the following talk is my research journey through the first phase of my capstone project uh, on training and retention of citizen scientists on the Great Barrier Reef and its effect on user confidence and quality. I hope you enjoy. Um, I'll leave my details at the end of the presentation if you have any further questions or advice for me. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy. Uh, so to begin my journey, I'd like to share my process. Uh, for those who aren't already familiar, uh, the Double Diamond is a design process model that was developed by the British Design Council in 2005 and that of which, which I've adopted throughout my studies. Uh, so this is a model I'll be referencing throughout the presentation to explain my journey through the, my capstone study. So at the beginning of the year, I was asked to explore any topic I wanted for my honours project. So essentially, we're given the year to produce a design solution to address an identified opportunity that's grounded in research. So this is that first divergent peak of the double diamond method. I had been on a charter to the Outer Great Barrier Reef of the Torres Strait at the beginning of the year and was very inspired by both the environment and the crew we were with. Um, just by roaming around the boat, listening to the crew and just being in the water and experiencing the reef itself, I became very inspired and decided to hone in specifically on reef management, monitoring and maintenance for my early research. During this time, I was also introduced to the Great Reef Census, which is a citizen science program run by the citizens of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, thus prompting me to start exploring citizen science in this space. This led to my initial research direction to explore current practices within the marine citizen science industry. Once that initial research direction was established, um, a literature review was then conducted to transition from that discovery phase to converge towards a defining stage. So for the literature review, I analysed 49 peer-reviewed articles uh, in relation to the headings listed on the screen. The marine citizen science industry uh, is using primarily contributory programs with limited examples of co-created and collaborative programs. Uh, this is in an interesting trend and it does correlate with other sources that found low participation can be associated with limited organisation participant engagement, uh, as long, along with other geographical and economic limitations that are prolific within the field. Uh, the literature also identified that there are minimal data quality control protocols in place for data management. The identified gap that I ended up targeting, however, was the intrinsic link between uh, data quality and the confidence and overall satisfaction of a citizen science, and then the subsequent effect on the initial recruitment and engagement for ongoing participation. So that led to my research question, exploring the link between different training and recruitment methods and how that's impacting citizen scientists and their work. To thoroughly investigate this question, I broke it down into three categories. So I was looking at what specific activities and training is completed by active organizations, what data quality measures are in place, and also how are active organizations are dealing with the well-being and satisfaction considerations for their citizen scientists. So to further define the research, it was divided into two phases. Our phase one was six interviews with active programs that along with the literature guided the generation of a concurrent protocol for a series of 12 observation sessions that I did with members of the general public. Uh, due to the scope, time and budget allocated for this project, it was only a small sample to gather an insight as opposed to trends. Uh, however, further investigation with larger data pools have potential to generate future trends within this area. So I hosted interviews with representatives from the listed programs and organizations above to gather insights into current practices, limitations and opportunities, as well as their relationships with um, participating citizen scientists. These were then transcribed and analyzed using thematic coding. So after the transcription, the first cycle of coding was used to establish initial codes, while the second um, cycle categorized these into themes. Notable training methods cited included both on-site and online methods. However, the most common came, from, it came in the form of written online instruction. So this could be through an app or a website. Um, but in terms of quality control measures, considering the geographic and economic restrictions on any given program, uh, the quality control methods are primarily reliant on the trust of the data submission from citizen science as organizations don't have resources to address every individual submission. 
which when compared to the literature that found that confidence is fed through feedback and therefore impacts the breadth of participating individuals. So that begs the question on how to increase participant confidence through methods other than individualized feedback. Another notable finding was the analysis of activities. Organizations are only requiring about a 70 to 80% proficiency for any given task, um, which I will discuss more in a later slide. Additionally, the key factors that impact participant retention and initial recruitment is just general awareness and as well as site accessibility. So the structure of existing programs was cross-referenced with the initial literature review findings to guide the development of a concurrent protocol for an observation activity. So now we're beginning to diverge out into that developing stage. So for the concurrent protocol that went alongside the observation activity, I wanted to create an accessible model. Uh, so I designed an image analysis and activity that resembled activities completed by both the virtual reef diver and the great reef census. The participants were given a series of 10 images and were asked to circle a selection of phenomena listed on the screen. So as is being depicted, uh, using Adobe Acrobat, the sample of participants were asked to circle various elements of images in the associated color to the given key. So the sample of 12 was divided between three training methods. So a written video and in-person delivery method. Uh, so the in-person involved myself being present in the initial training phase, while the other two groups were either given a video clip with supplementary audio that explained the process or a written explanation with supporting imagery. So once these activities were completed, the participants also did a short survey to collect demographic information and also their opinions on the task at hand. The observation sessions were hosted over Zoom to accommodate for lockdown restrictions as well as long distance participants as they spanned all across the east coast of Australia. Uh, um, it also provided the opportunity to observe how they approach the activity and observe any reactions they had towards the task. Then the completed images were analysed using an analog image cor correlation tool. Uh, this was used to analyse the accuracy of participant image analysis. Uh, traditionally, a digital image analysis tool is used um, to analyse imagery of the sort. However, due to the scope, time and budget of this project, it wasn't feasible. Our future exploration of these training methods should implement digital programs to get a more accurate estimate of, of participant accuracy. Additional data such as time, transcribed conversation and additional observational comments were also included. So what I found from these tests were participants from both the video and in-person training modes had a generally high proficiency while also being faster on average at the given task as pictured in the graphs above. Um, it was interesting to see that even just an element of human interaction through voice could potentially increase user confidence and thus getting more accurate results. Another interesting aspect was 11 of the 12 participants on average fell within that 70 to 80% proficiency or higher target required by active programs. Continuing on confidence, all participants were asked how they felt while completing the task. So three of the five confident participants uh, came from the in-person training, while the two that expressed no confidence were a part of the written delivery mode, which sort of just supports our accuracy findings from the previous slide. We now shift from the development to the delivery phase of our model. So to summarize the findings from the literature, interviews and observation tasks into categories, the three facets are confidence and communication, participation, boundaries and then incentive. Throughout both the observation activity and within the literature, it's clear that communication or some form of engagement is essential when trying to maintain and satisfy user confidence. Um, as well as that, participation boundaries is another topic to tackle. Obviously, we're working in an environment that not everyone has access to, so finding methods like online participation invites a new audience to have an applica the applicable skills to complete it. So this appeared in all three of um, my research methods. Um, and then finally, incentivizing. So this was echoed throughout the interviews and literature. Um, by providing motivation, people are more likely to continue a relationship with the organization. So at the end of my research phase of my capstone, I had to develop design criteria that will lead into potential op design opportunities. 
Uh, so the following section will be going over my suggested design directions uh, and then finally discussing what I'm currently generating. So the first concept I came up with was Coral Match. So this was an app-based solution. Um, I decided to try and monopolize off one of the biggest markets at the moment, which is smartphones. Um, something that you have in your pocket all the time. A game solution is always a good way to engage an audience. Um, they're more in, likely to be enticed to revisit um, your software. Uh, so I was planning on using 3D benthic mapping to generate brief imagery that allowed um, participants to interact with or potentially analyze uh, that imagery. But then I found out that NASA's already implemented one very, very similar called NemoNet. So obviously this was not the solution I went forward with, but definitely a valid way, way to explore this space. So the mapping camera came from the idea of lowering, lowering the initial barrier to entry. Um, so as rental equipment, it can be loaned out to collect mass data. Um, but an added bonus is the incentive of obtaining a high quality reef imagery without having to source a, an underwater camera. Okay. Finally, the coral capture would obviously have to be renamed, but like recapture imagery, having a system that allows people to train AI from the comfort of their own home lowers barrier to entry, but also gets aid in that feedback for potential revisiting. So maybe it, it's a gamified solution. So like they are aware unlike recapture that they're training AI. Um, but also by having an established AI identification system, mass data will be able to be consistently and accurately read uh, in real time. So the product I'm currently producing is the mapping camera. I like the flexibility of that and there's a lot of um, ways I can implement it effectively onto the market as a piece of rental equipment, as opposed to developing something that everyone would have access to. Um, also gives me a bit more range with the camera quality uh, we're working with. So this is a small macro camera um, to collect image-based data. Um, so what makes this different is there are inbuilt sensors into the camera um, that can map things like depth, temperature, anything that citizen science organizations may look at that would affect the water quality, thus like oral health or marine life health. These sensors are built into the camera and the data collected per image or per video is coded into the file. So therefore, when you upload it to the database, that information isn't lost or um, misplaced as some organizations mentioned happened. So the camera is then mounted into a pair of snorkel goggles. I wanted it to be a hands-free experience as I've gone on to now talking to people who have been snorkeling and especially the people who aren't confident in the water, they want to still document their experience, but they don't feel comfortable having one of their hands taken up. So this eliminates that problem. Unfortunately, at the time of filming, this is as far as this product has been developed. Um, I would love to talk to you about it further. Um, at the point of presentation. So I will leave my details on the next slide um, if you have any further questions about it or if you wanna see it when it's released at the end of the year, I'd love to let you know. But um, thank you so much for letting me talk at you again. Um, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your conference.